button correctly. There we go. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, party people, and welcome to another festive, exciting episode of Office Hours while I try to figure out my new streaming setup. Normally, I have a little button here on my stream deck, and I push it in order to go live, and all kinds of things happen. Well, I just got finished setting it up for my new app here, and I hit it, and nothing happened the way it was supposed to. <laughs> so I had to go do some quick things behind the scenes. So now let's go in and jump in and start uh, answering some of y'all's questions. Uh, before I jump in, I should say hi to uh, Michael J. Swart, who's out on the stream. We kind of have Canadian weather here today, actually. It's overcast in Las Vegas, and it was uh, raining overnight, something that doesn't happen very often to us here, uh, which is kind of a bummer because Andy and Kenji Mallon are in town. And so I've been driving around, uh, uh, showing them different parts of Las Vegas and, and eating and drinking a lot. So, uh, and a friend of theirs, Matt, along for the ride too, having a good old time. So let's go in and take a look at some of the highly upvoted questions uh, that y'all put in here. Let's start recording those questions and. Tim Bolero says, Hi Brent, my friend knows your view on rebuilding indexes. He also thinks that external fragmentation only affects a few things. For scientific purposes, what metrics should he look at to see if defrag makes a difference? Let me rephrase your question. My friend thinks he's a performance tuner, and he thinks he could make things go faster if he just could figure out where the speedometer is. If you tell me that you can make my car go faster and you don't even know where the speedometer is, daddy's going to put you in the back seat. Daddy's going to give you some movies that you can play on your iPad while we drive. You can start by watching Mastering Server Tuning, my training class, where the very first module covers where SQL Server speedometer is. But until you want to start playing around and getting scientific when you don't even know where the speedo is, hop in the back seat, kiddo, and watch movies on your iPad. Brutal, I know. Next up, Chandwich asks, Hi Brent, what kind of advantages or disadvantages do you see with ChatGPT? So ChatGPT lets you ask uh, ChatGPT for something and it will synthesize its own output. For example, you could say, show me a query that will give me the salespeople who sold the most units in the last quarter. Well, the problem is ChatGPT doesn't know anything about your database schema. And until it does, it can't really do anything with writing queries or writing stored procedures for that matter. Someday, years from now, ChatGPT will have some kind of plug-in where it will learn about your database schema and it'll learn what salespeople are, what products are, what last quarter means for your business, because often businesses operate on slightly different calendar tables where just because it's the first quarter of the year, January 1st through March 31st, doesn't mean it's the first quarter of your company's accounting periods, for example. So years from now, ChatGPT will be at the point where it may know a little about your database schema. And at that point, it'll be right caught up to the year 2000 when Microsoft introduced English Query and then promptly discontinued it like a year later because it simply wasn't able to keep up with the complexities of databases. I don't see a future in the next five years where things like ChatGTP can write accurate queries about what's inside your database. I see a future where it's going to write inaccurate queries about your database, but you already have something free that can accomplish that. That's users. <laughs> users already are perfectly capable of writing incorrect queries all day long, as Renegade Larson can attest. Good morning, sir. Next up, we have Brent's Fast Cars. Brent's Fast Car says, Hi, Brent. I've been reading one of your posts about SQL Server virtualization. You talk about when there are more cores than standard edition allows and using affinity masking to disable cores. No, you misheard something in there inside my videos. I don't know where you heard that from. If you think that you did hear that, go back and rewatch that video again, but pay a little bit more attention this time. SQL Server Standard Edition supports up to 24 CPU cores, 
And if you find yourself needing more than 24 CPU cores, you probably have other problems that you need Enterprise Edition for as well. For example, its ability to do online index builds or uh, merry-go-round scans, all kinds of things. So I, I'm not the kind of person who would disable cores in order to get to work with Standard Edition. The other thing you might be mis misunderstanding is the number of sockets that Standard Edition supports. It supports up to four sockets. But go back and rewatch whatever it was that you think I was saying we'd use affinity masking for, because that, that's not the right answer there. Next up, we have Bill Bergen. Bill says, Brent, I have to say it again, you are a genius. I'll let you say that a few times if you like. I'll give you a moment for everyone to say it out loud now. I don't really believe that. I'm kind of a moron, as anybody who's around me for an extended period of time can attest. I struggle with all kinds of things in technology. Is there a way to complete <laughs> this question is probably a good example. Is there a way to completely use uh, T SQL in order to script out everything in Resource Governor? I have no idea. Uh, that's not something that I've ever looked at trying to script out completely with T SQL. The place that I would go check is PowerShell. There is a framework called DBA Tools. You go to dbatools.io, and they have all kinds of scripts that make it easier for you to migrate one SQL Server settings over to another SQL Server. I would be pretty surprised if they didn't already have Resource Governor included in that configuration copying. So start with dbatools.io. Next up, Tom in Yorks says, what arguments for there for and against manually creating stats, who does this, on every column of every table when auto create stats are updated? Look, dude, if auto create statistics are updated, SQL Server will, as you might guess from the name, automatically create statistics. Isn't it funny how that name works? Why? Would you do manual work when it's automatically done for you? What's the problem you're trying to solve? What this feels like to me is that you've spent too much time reading people's blog posts and not enough time asking end users, what's the biggest performance problem that you're facing? What is it that people are complaining about with their queries? But always, when you before you start touching buttons or changing things, ask, what's the problem that I'm trying to solve? And go tackle it from there. This question, no one should be manually creating stats on just single columns in every table. That makes no sense. Okay, so you did ask, though, what are the arguments against it? SQL Server's auto-create statistics will automatically, as you might guess by the name, create statistics on any column that you query and you need a surge or a... a uh, cardinality estimation on it will automatically add the stat as soon as you run one query. Just one query! You run one query against the column, SQL Server will automatically create those stats for you. Yes, that one query will need to wait for a matter of milliseconds to seconds for those statistics to be gathered, but who cares? It's one query. Then every other query through the rest of time that needs to analyze that, the, the uh, cardinality estimation on that column will have the stats already available. And all you're doing by adding those additional statistics manually ahead of time is they may not even ever be needed. And now you're adding more work that has to be done every time SQL Server updates statistics. Because when SQL Server updates stats, it scans the whole object once for every stat that you have, as Biggie Smalls famously sang, most stats, mo problems. Next up, Wasn't Me asks, a software company produces a, so <laughs> it's like one of those word problems, a train leaves Philadelphia. A software company produces software, they can't use their software, I like that already, uh, because they, they're worried about employees seeing the compensations of other employees. Could Always Encrypted be the solution, and who should own the keys? Always Encrypted was designed for this exact to solve this exact problem so that people can't see things inside the database, and it makes perfect sense for salaries, because you generally don't need salaries for things like most reports. 
that's a lie, right? Executives actually run reports and they want to see salaries inside there. People run payroll analysis and they want to see salaries, but I digress. So in theory, you encrypt things in the application first. That's what always encrypted is for. Now, the second part of your question is who should own the keys? In theory, they're locked in some kind of key protection vault and there are hardware utilities for this, software utilities for this, there are cloud utilities for it. Azure has one, I forget what it's called, where your application passes in basically a username and password in order to get the key. And the key system will go to check to see, is this query running from a valid server? Because you wouldn't want someone passing in the key from SQL Server Management Studio running on somebody's laptop. You can check that at runtime and make sure that the application that's requesting the key is requesting it from a valid place at a valid time for a valid purpose. So if you want to look at those, you search for like SQL Server key vaults or secret vaults, and there are all kinds of uh, third party tools to solve that problem, as opposed to trying to get the CEO uh, to manually approve every change request and get involved with every deployment. Uh, let's see here. Surly Dev says two Brent streams in one week. Yes, I am spoiling you. I wanted to do more than that, but I uh, had all kinds of stuff going on this week. Uh, and Spitfire, good to see you as well. Let's see, the last question in the queue, uh, Lifelong Learner says, my friend asked the other day where we were talking about archiving a two terabyte audit table to reduce its size, what's better to rebuild the indexes or drop and recreate? That's not archiving. If you're recreating indexes or rebuilding, that's not archiving. I don't know what goal you think you're accomplishing. But the goal with archiving is to reduce the size of something by either getting rid of data or moving it somewhere else. But if you just rebuild and recreate, what's the point? I don't get it. Now, let me let me throw something else weird at you. If you're saying which one of them is going to run faster, the problem with rebuilding them is you need the space for the existing object plus the brand new object at the same time. It's going to read from the old object in order to build the new object to make it go faster. Okay, so it's going to need additional space, which can have other impacts on your performance goals. If you drop and recreate, you don't need the space for both objects at the same time, but instead of reading from the old object and building the new one, it'll have to read from the clustered index or heap of the table, which can make rebuilding an index or can make dropping and recreating an index slower as opposed to just rebuilding it in place. So that's why you would compare the pros and cons. Do you need space or do you need performance? And you can go from there. Uh, the other thing to think about is uh, whether or not queries are simultaneously running at the same time your uh, maintenance work is happening. If queries are running at the same time, then you're going to be better off rebuilding the object in place with Enterprise Edition because the, the old version of the, the object can stay online. Whereas if you drop it and recreate it, <laughs> I've seen a funny situation where Somebody's like, we're going to make our, our maintenance faster by dropping and recreating. But what they didn't realize that when they dropped it, all the queries that were still happening against that were now dead slow and doing table scans. So their server fell over. They couldn't wait long enough to create the new index uh, to put it in place, which is kind of funny. Okay, so there we go. There's a handful of questions out there. Nice, quick, short office hours. Now, uh, I will free y'all up to go check out the, whoa, check out the work that's involved with the rest of your day. You probably want to avoid that, is what I'm guessing. You probably want to avoid the work that you have through the rest of the day. So what work am I dodging? In SQL Constant Care, that's our monitoring app that uh, where people send in data all day long for thousands of servers around the world. SQL Constant Care, uh, we, we were always compatible with Linux, but we didn't have any special recommendations around Linux. If you ran SQL Server on Linux, I didn't have any separate rules that I ran in order to tell you if you were being configured correctly or not. And for years, like five years now, it didn't matter because nobody was running SQL Server on Linux. We got our first customer running SQL Server on Linux like eh, two months ago, three months ago. 
So now I actually have to go uh, analyze my uh, the data that's coming out of there and to go give them different recommendations, and I'm kind of dreading and avoiding that. Surly Dev says, I'm not sure which work I'm dodging. I haven't even looked at the ticket queue today. And Surly Dev is in the United Kingdom. It's 8 a.m. U.S. It's probably near the end of Surly Dev's workday. So congratulations, Surly Dev, on avoiding uh, work through most of the entire day. That's Although it could be because you, well, I was going to say it could be because you're working on emergencies, but that's not it because you're here on Twitch. So uh, how, uh, how uh, much work could there possibly be? Uh, me for my day, so I'm going to work on that, uh, looking at the data coming out of SQL Server on Linux uh, this morning. And then uh, Andy Leonard, Kenji, and uh, Matt will be up and around later this morning. And I think because it's, oh, I think the rain's stopping here. Uh, so then they're either going to go down to Fremont Street or else we're going to go look at Area 15 in Las Vegas, which is just one of the coolest things. So I will see y'all on the next office hours. Let's find out if my stop button works. I have no idea if it's actually going to work. Three, two, one.